Well, should we see how we did? Hey, welcome to the shop. Today I'm gonna to show you how to set up any MIG welder for flux core welding. Even if you've done this before, there's some little nuanced things that you may have missed that can make it run even better. I'm setting up my machine to run a lot of flux core tutorials that we're gonna see coming out on the channel, so stay tuned for those. Right now, let's get to the machine. So my MIG welder's parked back here on this cart. I'm gonna disconnect it from the gas cylinder so I can set it up on the table and we can all have a better view of what's going on. So this is one of several MIG welders that I have. It's the HTP Pro Pulse 220. It's one of my favorite to run and you've seen me run it quite a bit over the past couple of years. I'm gonna remove the solid wire that's in here for welding with shielding gas and I'll just clip it off right here. Some people will try to roll this back up onto the spool to save the wire but I, I think it's just as well to, to let it go and then just pull the rest of it out through the end of the gun. So let's talk about the wire for a minute. You can see this is the solid wire that came out of here. It's copper coated uh, most of the time, not always, but uh, that's the solid wire that I use with shielding gas. And this is the flux core wire that I'll use without shielding gas. Now it comes in different size spools. These right here are eight inch spools. It also comes, you can get it in little two pound spools, little four inch spools like that, um, that work okay. And there are larger spools. You notice here inside the machine, this machine actually has a spacer in there because this can accommodate a larger 12 inch spool. Now let's just talk for a minute about the actual wire itself. There are a couple different types of flux cord wire. There's self shielded like we're using here where you don't need any shielding gas. There's also gas shielded flux core wire. It's often called by trade names, dual shield or outer shield. Um, that's, that's a totally different setup than what we're doing here today. So I have videos on that you can find on my channel, but we're focused on the self shielded flux core and the specific spec that we're running is E71T-11. You'll see a lot of the flux core wires out there, E71T-GS. What that means is it's not to a specific spec basically, but the manufacturer has some liberty. I've used a ton of different brands of flux cord wires and most of them work just fine, honestly. Some are a little better than others. But uh, yeah, I stick with the E71 T-11 most of the time. Now before I install the spool onto here, I'm just gonna point out about this spindle right here and something that's often overlooked. Right here in the middle, there's this second screw. In a lot of cases, it's just a nut that uh, sits on there and that controls the tension. See, if I loosen that way up right here, this whole thing can spin freely. So I need to tighten that to keep it from free spooling, right? So then it adds some resistance. Now, in this case, this machine uh, uses a spacer here as a friction fit because it can accommodate that larger size spool. Uh, but in some cases, the pin on here will engage with a hole right there in the spool. So that's gonna depend on your particular machine. But right here, I can slide it right on and secure it with the nut. Now with this on, that feels pretty good. See, if it's too loose, what'll happen when it gets spinning, is it'll continue to spin and that wire can come over the side there and it won't stay on very well. What a lot of people will do is just crank this down so it's really having to grind on there. There's no point in putting that much load on the components. A good measure is, can I move it with one finger and not have it free spool? A little tighter. Let's keep going. Back off just a little bit. Right there, that's the, that's the sweet spot, just like that. So it spins easily, but it doesn't keep spinning and I can just move it around with one finger. Now, before I put the wire into the feeder, let me release the idler tension and let's talk about drive rolls because there are specific drive rolls for flux core welding. So this is the drive roll that I just removed. You can see there's two smooth, deep V grooves in it. And those work really well to grab on that steel hard wire because you can apply a lot of force to it. This wire is tubular though, and so it's just metal on the outside filled with a flux powder. So instead, we'll use a knurled roller like this that can really grip those edges. Now there are two different sizes. Generally, the size reading will be listed on the outside. So when it's installed, what you can read is the size that's on there. 
Now with the right drive roll installed, I can feed my wire in. Rather than trying to straighten this out, I'm just gonna clip the end off right here um, so that I have a nice smooth start to be able to feed into my guide and ultimately into my gun liner. Since my gun's already installed on this machine, I'll just feed it right through and that usually goes just fine. Um, if it does get jammed, you might need to remove the gun and put it on. Now I'm gonna loosen this up right here. A lot of times this idler is way too tight. Almost always when I go to a machine that uh, I, I haven't been welding on, this is, this is tighter than it needs to be. So I'm gonna loosen it way up and we'll dial that in once I get the wire fed down through the gun. Now I'm over here at the front of the machine to take care of a step that a lot of people overlook. With self-shielded flux core, the polarity is almost always opposite of what you'd run with solid wire or with gas-shielded flux core. So I just need to remove the lead right here for my MIG gun. They're often these DINs connectors that just screw in now. Older machines or some different models, you actually have to get inside the machine and there are a couple lugs to remove. It's nice when they come out the front like this so it's easy to change but then I'll move my work clamp here and connect my work clamp to the positive terminal. And then my actual MIG gun will connect up to the negative terminal. What this will do is it'll send more heat into the material than into the wire because you're dealing with that tubular wire. You don't want to send all that heat in there. So that makes it run so much better. You get a lot less spatter. Hey, so I'm just gonna jump in here. If you are just getting started in learning, the actual learning process can be pretty frustrating. And while there's a lot of videos on my channel and out there on the internet that can help you to learn and you'll figure it out, you can do it much faster and much better if you have a solid plan. And I have some online courses I've put together where I walk you through step by step through the whole learning process showing you only what you need to know exactly when you need to know it so that you can learn so much faster. Check those out in the description. Let's get back to this setup. All right, before I feed my wire through here, I'm gonna take care of a couple of things up here at the end of the gun. So I have these MIG welding pliers. If you haven't seen these before, they're really handy. They can do a ton of different things like clip your wire. They're good for removing the nozzle right here. So I'll slide that off. And then you can use them also if you have some spatter in there, you just stick them in the end and twist it around and it all comes out. So it's pretty nice there. But what I'm using them for right now is to remove the contact tip off the end right here. So I'll loosen that up and this contact tip is what conducts electricity from the machine into the wire. See the actual MIG wire, whoops, I dropped it. The actual MIG wire doesn't conduct the electricity all the way from the welding machine up to your welding arc. There's a wire inside the uh, lead and the gun that puts it to a contact tip. Now this is really important to have these in good condition for everything to weld really well and they need to be the right size for your wire. So the wire that I pulled out of here was 30 thousandths. I'm gonna use 35 thousandths wire, so I need to change this out to the right size. But while I have it off, I'm gonna go ahead and feed the wire out through the end of the gun. To feed the wire out, I'm just gonna hold the trigger down on the gun like this, and it'll feed out through the lead. There, once it feeds out of there, I can go grab my new contact tip. So I'm gonna opt for a used one in good condition. I'll just slide the wire right through and thread it down tight. So let's talk for a second about the gas nozzle. What do you need it for if you're not actually flowing any shielding gas? Well, you don't need it and you can run welds without it, but I like to have something on there just to minimize the amount of spatter and other gunk that gets up on the diffuser and other parts of the MIG gun. So I think it's a good idea to just leave it in place. There's really no advantage, uh, in my opinion, to removing it for anything. Some machines actually have a gasless nozzle like this. So if your machine came with something like this or you wanna purchase one, then you can get one of those, but I don't have one for this machine. It'll be fine to run just the regular, uh, regular shielding gas nozzle to provide some protection to those components. Let's go ahead and revisit the idler tension on the actual drive feed mechanism here. Um, a lot of times, like I said before, when I've come across machines that's way tighter than it needs to be, and there's no need to put that extra load on all those components. So uh, what you can do, the, the textbook answer, at least with solid wires, to actually point your gun down, push wire against a piece of wood and have it curl up and do that without slipping. It's a lot easier to just use a gloved finger like this and make sure it doesn't slip. So I'll pull the trigger right there. See, I'm getting some slippage on it. 
you can see that slippage. So I'm going to go ahead and tighten this down right here on this particular machine around a number two is usually pretty good. Notice that when I pinch the wire there, it's just pushing through. You can see it continues to feed. So I know I'm good there. I don't want to go any tighter than that. And that's really much looser than, than you usually see. Well, should we see how we did? All right, let's brush that off. Give it a little chipping, a little brushing. That's not too bad, not too bad, especially for self-shielded flux core. I'm gonna show you how to get welds like that in the next video, so, so keep a lookout for that. So I thought it might be helpful to just come over here to the board and do a quick recap. You can grab a screenshot of this and help you remember what to do. So first of all, we installed our spool, just the spool break so it won't free spool, but you don't want that too tight. A lot of people get that too tight. Then the proper drive roll needs to be in there with those knurls in it to feed that tubular wire, followed by the polarity. Make sure you're on DC electrode negative to get things running well. Then you need to have the right contact tip in and make sure it's a good one. And finally, adjust the feed tension of that idler on your feeder. Don't have that too tight. There's no reason to do that. And if you do all these things, everything's going to run so much better for you. You know, a lot of these have to do with the wire feeding. And I come across people all the time who are learning to flux core weld and they're talking about they have an electrical problem and they think they need to go buy some expensive work clamp and all that other stuff. And the reality is a lot of wire feeding problems manifest similar to electrical problems. It's a lot more common to have a wire feeding problem than an electrical problem. So make sure that you've covered all your ducts, have those in a row on the setup and things are gonna go a lot better for you. All right, so go check that stuff to get everything running in tip top shape. Thanks a ton for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video or learned something here, let me know by hitting that thumbs up below. We'll see you next time.